at this time our kids are going to head out to Ogden Kids Worship. Just a reminder, parents, that you can pick them up over there. They'll hold them over there in the fellowship hall after the service. That way we're not just releasing them to run rampant uh, in the parking lot. So you can pick them up over there uh, after the service is over. Now, for the rest of us, we are going to be in Luke chapter 15, beginning really a three-week study on what is sometimes referred to as the great story or the great parable. And I can tell you this, of all the passages in the Bible, I've been preaching now for some 20 years, of all the passages in the Bible, this is hands down my favorite passage to preach and to teach on. It holds a very special place in my heart, dating all the way back to, I believe it was 2005. And in 2005, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip to Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and do some work there. We were doing some, uh, during the day, we would spend time there in the the mountains, uh, doing backyard Bible clubs, and and, and ministering to the kids, and doing some construction on a church there. And then each night, we would gather together for a meal, and the leader of our group would teach on this passage. And I just remember... As he would walk through it, and we would, I would see the, the depth and the richness of this passage. I was just blown away with how much Jesus is packing into just these few verses. And so I need you guys to listen really carefully and really quickly over the next three weeks as we unpack this great parable, the great story of Jesus. Now, if I had to kind of outline and share with you the central message of what this text is going to be about, it is about this, that we as his church, as followers of Jesus, are called to retrieve and receive sinners. That God has placed on our lives a calling to not just sit within our walls, but we must retrieve, go after, actively seek the lost in order to retrieve them and share the gospel with them. And then when those lost people come, when they respond to the gospel, when they draw close to Jesus, we as the church better be ready to receive them like Christ. Now as we begin to unpack this study, I want to share with you something that is going to be foundational in helping us to understand this passage. See, our tendency is to look here at Luke 15 and we try to treat it as if it is three separate parables. The parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable of the prodigal son. But the reality is this is not three different parables. It's actually one parable with four separate and unique parts, each illustrating and teaching an important lesson. Now, the reason why I say there's some evidence that I point to in supporting that this is not three parables, but it is in fact one parable together. One of the places that we can look to that kind of shows this is down in verse 3. In response to the situation that we're going to be describing here in just a second, it says in verse 3, So he, Jesus, told them this parable. Singular. This parable. So it's one parable. We could also look down at verse 8 as the story transitions from the lost sheep to the lost coin. And there's this connecting word there in verse 8 where it says, Or what woman? And so it connects. It follows in the same line with the same story. And then again, down in verse 11, there's that same kind of connecting word where it says, And he said... So all of these different stories, all of these different parts connect to illustrate this one underlying truth that we as the church, we as followers of Jesus, better be ready to retrieve and receive sinners in the way that Christ did. Now, notice that I said that this is one parable with four different parts. We tend to miss this uh, and only focus on Three of them, and I think when we only focus on three of them, we miss really the entire point of this story that Jesus is trying to get across to us. 
Because we're going to see here in this parable four things that are lost. The first is this lost sheep that has gone astray, and the shepherd goes after and searches until he finds it. Then we're going to see next week this lost coin that is lost there in the home, and the woman sweeps her house, and she stirs up the dust until she finds it. And then our focus typically goes to this lost younger brother, the, what we sometimes refer to as the prodigal son, who is lost far from home, who is strayed from the father into the far country. And as he comes home, the father receives him willingly. But the one that we typically skip is the lost elder brother, which is ultimately the culmination of this entire story. We don't normally even think about him in this story, but the reality is that of all these things that are lost, the coin and the sheep and the younger brother, of all of these things that we see in this chapter that are lost, he is the only one that at the conclusion of the text here remains lost. In fact, it's he that represents the very Pharisees that motivate the telling of this story in the first place. So as we set the stage, let me pray for us as we get started, and then we're going to jump into verse 1, just walking through this text, teaching through this text the depth of what Jesus is trying to get to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, for this time, for the opportunity to open your word, to dive into the scriptures. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the transformation and the life that it brings. I thank you for the way that you demonstrate your goodness each and every day. Lord, I pray even now as we proclaim the word of God that you would shield the hearts and minds of those who are here today. That you would help them to, to listen closely. That, it might, that the word of God may dwell in their hearts and that it may empower them to live for you this week. God, we praise you, Father. And may everything that we do, every thought that we think, every word that we proclaim be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So look there together at verse 1 and see what it says. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Now I want to stop there for a moment, kind of unpack some of what we see here as we kind of establish the setting that's going to give us the foundation for all that Jesus is about to share in this parable. It begins there in verse 1 by saying, Now the tax collectors and the sinners, the wicked, those that uh, had flaws and faults and failures in their life, but it doesn't, it's not limited to just those. This would also include maybe the crippled and the blind, the lame, the diseased, anyone who might have been unclean, anybody who might have had a, a past or had some problems. And these tax collectors and these sinners, these outcasts of society, it says, were all drawing near to him in order to hear him. Now, a little background of, of this. This word, this, this, this verb that's used here for drawing near to him is a continuing action verb, meaning that what's happening here is not just happening once and that's it. It is continuing to take place. We see the same thing with that word there, to hear him. They are continuing to hear him. So it might read something like this, that the tax collectors and the sinners kept on continually drawing near to him in order to keep on listening to him. I love this fact that there was just something about Jesus that drew sinners to him. Maybe it was the fact that for their, for their religious leaders, they'd always met with judgment. They'd always been kind of cast out. But in Jesus, they found someone that loved them, that welcomed them unto himself. And so there was something about Jesus that drew sinners and sinful people unto himself. That's good news, amen? That sinners can come into the very arms of Jesus. That sinful people are and still continue to be drawn to Jesus. Now, as on the one hand we have these sinners continually, perpetually being drawn to Jesus and continually listening to Him, hearing Him, sharing fellowship with Him, 
We have that picture on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have the Pharisees. And it tells us in verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. And it's that same continuing action word. That they continued, they perpetually, they kept on grumbling and complaining, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And we've all met people like this before, right? Something good's happening over here. Maybe they don't necessarily like what's happening there. And so instead of jumping in, instead of listening, instead of uh, being a part of what God is doing, they just sit back and they what? They just sit back and they grumble continuously. I want to pause here for a moment. This is where I probably get myself in trouble. So man, just hang in there. Because there's something here I think worth addressing. See, we need to be aware of the fact that if we aren't careful, we aren't careful, church we can very easily find ourselves identifying more with the Pharisees than with the ones that are actively seeking after Jesus. You see, here's the reality. I'm not as concerned about the Pharisee in the Bible as I am the one that's within me and within my own heart. I'm not as concerned about the Pharisee in the Bible as I am the one in my church pew every Sunday. See, the problem that we see here is that the Pharisees are fixated on the external. All the while, Jesus is looking unto people's hearts. And it may be that some people are coming to Jesus with flaws and failures and struggles. But they're coming to Jesus anyway. And the Pharisees are looking at this and all they can see are their flaws. All they can see is that they don't act the way we do. They don't talk the way we do. They don't dress the way we do. And instead of being excited that people are coming to God and they're listening, all they can do is sit back and judge that those people are different. See, if we're not careful, this is where each of us can fall into a trap. And instead of looking and seeing people who are sincerely seeking after Jesus, the heart of the Pharisee only focuses on the fact that people don't dress the right way or act the right way or do the right thing. Listen to me, church. When lost people begin to come to Jesus, the church is going to start looking a lot differently because they don't know any better. That's not a bad thing. I pray that lost people come here. I pray that lost people come to know Jesus. And guess what? The church is going to look and act and sound a little bit differently until Christ gets a hold of their heart and begins to transform them into his own image. And guess what? That's our task, not to sit back and judge them on external things. Instead, we're called to be like Jesus and love them and shepherd them and lead them to Christ. See, my prayer, my prayer, is, Lord, expose those areas of our own lives where maybe we identify more with the Pharisees than we do with Jesus. So we have these two pictures. The sinful people are coming and the self-righteous people are complaining. Now, look at what specifically they're complaining about. They're complaining because they say, this man receives, welcomes unto himself sinners and eats with them. Oh, this word for receives is a, it's a middle voice verb, meaning that as he acts, that action then comes back literally on himself. Literally, it's saying that Jesus is opening his arms to, he's embracing and welcoming unto himself. And within the text, one of the things that I want us to understand here, especially here, that there are certain words that carry what I'm going to call major emphasis. There are major emphasis words and minor emphasis words. And here in this text, one of the words that carries major emphasis, as if the the author is highlighting it and underlining it, is this word, sinners. This man, Jesus Christ, receives sinners. Sinners. Thank God he does. If he didn't receive sinners, I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. Thank God that Jesus is the God who welcomes sinners unto himself, into his arm. And he doesn't just welcome sinners. It says, this man receives sinners and does what? Eats with them. Shares table with fellowship with him, this intimacy that's normally reserved for just the closest of friends and family. He welcomes them into his 
circle, and he shares this meal with them, and he lives and does life with them. This is Jesus. And so in light of this grumbling, sinners coming to listen, Pharisees grumbling and complaining, in light of this, verse 3 tells us, so he told them this parable. Now watch how he starts this story. He says, what man of you, let's just read this all, I'll just read this first section right here. He says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. I want you to notice what Jesus does here first. He begins by saying, What man of you? Now, what I want you to notice here is that Jesus does the same thing that we saw him doing last week with the lawyer in the parable of the Good Samaritan. These that were opposing Jesus would come to him on the offensive, attacking, seek to try to trip him up and, and distract him, to catch him in some kind of fallacy. And Jesus, in his expert way, would take their offenses and he would turn around on them and put the ball back in their court so that now, instead of being for them on the offense, now they were on the defense responding to his question. And so here are these Pharisees, and they're grumbling, and they're complaining against him. And so the first thing Jesus does is he puts the ball back in their court, and he asks them, What man of you? In other words, what would you do if you found yourself in this situation? He's like saying, you criticize me for going after that which is lost, for welcoming sinners and lost people under myself. But what would you do if you found yourself in this situation? So he asks. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, major emphasis, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them? All right, so stick here with me, okay? You ready? So this is the story about percentages. And we're going to see this in every single one of these. You guys uh, track with me here, okay? Don't miss this. So here we have 100 sheep, and one of them goes missing. What percentage of lostness is that? Somebody yell it out. 1%. All right. Hey, we're tracking. Good. Okay. In the next story, the parable of the coins, we're going to see that the woman has 10 coins and one of them goes missing. What percentage of that? What was that? Some of you are going, oh, no, math. <laughs> what was it? 10%. 10%. Then the third parable, we have two sons. What percentage is that? Okay, now pay attention to here. Okay. What did I tell you already? What percentage is it? 100%. See, we have so trained ourselves that because the older brother stayed at home, he must have been saved. And in reality, that's not the case. In fact, he is so lost that by the end of the parable, of all the things that were originally lost, he's the only one that still is. Do we get that? Have we caught the emphasis of what Jesus is trying to teach us so far in this story? That two out of these four things that he's going to paint a picture of, the sheep and the younger brother, are lost far from home. In the far country or out in the open country. Two out of the four of the things that Jesus says are lost, the coin is lost in the home, and the older brother is lost on the doorstep of his home. Here's what I think he's illustrating to us. That being lost and saved is not a matter of location. This is going to be hard for some of us. But hear me when I say this, that you can be just as lost sitting in a church pew every single Sunday as you can be passed out drunk in a gutter somewhere. It's not a matter of your location. It's a matter of your heart. And so we ask this question. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, if one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost? Now, 
I need you to listen carefully to me here and hear my heart, because what I'm going to say here at first is going to sound maybe a little bit off. My question is, what is the fact that he leaves this 99 in the open country? He just leaves them. In order to pursue this one that is lost, what does this tell us about those 99? I believe what it shows us is that to at least some extent, they don't count anymore. They don't matter anymore. That once you are saved in some way, shape, or form, you don't necessarily count anymore. Well, sometimes the way we act, we act like we're the only ones that do count. Like it's all about us. Now, don't misunderstand me here, okay? Because, of course, you matter to God. He died for you to save you. But it's exactly this fact that once we are in Christ, We are secure in Him. Meaning, we don't have to worry anymore about our salvation. We don't have to work and try to earn it anymore because He has already perfectly secured us through His blood. So we are now free. We don't have to continually focus the attention on trying to be good enough and earn it and work for our righteousness. Instead, we we are free to turn our attention towards those that are lost because in Christ we are secure. Church, this is our mission. Sometimes we get so fixated on keeping the 99 safe and happy that we never get to the point that we actually imitate Christ and go after the one that is lost. Now watch this. How long? How long does he search for this lost sheep? Look what it says there. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost? What? What? Until he finds it. So let me ask you this. How do you measure until? You want to know what until looks like? You want to know what until looks like? You have to walk the dusty streets of Jerusalem. You have to feel the lashes on his back and the thorns driven into his head. You have to feel the hair that is plucked from his beard and the rod as it strikes his face. You have to feel the shame of being stripped naked and having nails driven through the most sensitive parts of your body. And then you have to climb the rocky hill to Golgotha and stare up at the Savior dying on the cross. And church, that is what until looks like. It says that he went after that one that is lost. And he did so until he finds it. Listen, sometimes I think we just give up. We as a church, we just give up too easy. We share the gospel. We share our faith with somebody and if they reject it or they don't receive it immediately, we go, oh, well, I tried. We just give up. Aren't you glad that's not what Jesus did? Aren't you glad that Jesus sought that lost sheep until he didn't stop That he endured and pressed on because he loved us that much. Now watch this. This is powerful. It says in verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Now there's something interesting here. Not not this picture. I put this picture here because I want us to see kind of the illustration here. But almost every artist's portrayal of this I have ever seen... How is Jesus usually carrying the sheep? In his arms, right? He's carrying the sheep in his arms. But that's not what we see pictured here in verse 5. What does it say? He lays it on his shoulder. Now, if he lays it on his shoulder, what does that imply that he's probably doing with his hands? Holding on to his legs, right? If he just put it on his shoulders and just started walking, what's that sheep going to do? Fall off. So what it's implying here is that he's holding onto it, much like we see in this picture. He's probably holding it by its legs. And I find this a powerful picture in light of what we read in places like Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. See, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, speaking of this exact same sheep, it uses the words that, and one of them has gone astray, meaning he is going astray. It is a continuous action of straying. It's as if to say that every step that this sheep takes apart from its shepherd, it only serves to get it more and more and more lost. Because every step that it takes is in opposition. 
I think there's a picture there of those that are living apart from Christ. That when I am living apart from Christ, that every step that I take in my own power and through my own efforts only serves to get me more and more lost. But it was exactly in that moment when I couldn't save myself, when I couldn't head in the right direction, that Christ steps in and he rescues me from my wandering, from my straying, from my lostness. It's why we can sing in songs like Come Thou Fount. I love the song Come Thou Fount. But it's why we can sing these great lyrics like that Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Later in the song it says that we are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. So as the shepherd here lays this sheep on his shoulders, he would have had to hold on to its legs as if to say that these are only going to get you into trouble. So now, instead of allowing you to just go whichever direction you wanted to go, I'm now going to place you on my shoulders, and I'm going to carry you, and I'm going to keep you safe, and I'm going to secure you, and I'm going to watch over you. And notice where it says that he brings him, because there's something here that's unusual. He doesn't do what you would think that he would do. See, you would think that he would take him where? Back to the sheepfold, back to where the other sheep is. But that's not what he does here. He takes him where? Takes him home with him. Now, why does he do this? He tells him, verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. You know why he does this, I believe? Because he wants to celebrate. And she can celebrate. He wants to celebrate. I am so afraid that we miss in the church so many opportunities to celebrate what our God is doing because we are simply too focused on lesser things. Sinner, a sinner comes stumbling his way down the aisle and he places his faith in Jesus Christ, changing his eternal destination from hell to heaven. And many of us would look at our watch and think, wow, I wonder what's for lunch today. The church, have we forgotten how to celebrate? Have we forgotten how to recognize when our God is doing a mighty work and all we can do is sit back in amazement of his grandeur and grace Have we forgotten what it means to celebrate the goodness of our God, to be excited about Him? See, don't miss this point, that at the core of this parable is Jesus teaching us as His church how to retrieve and receive sinners. The first two parts to this parable, the lost sheep and the lost coin, are all about retrieving, going after that which is lost until we find it. The last two parts of the parable, the parable of the prodigal son and the older brother, are about how we receive sinners. In the first picture with the prodigal son, we see the father's way of receiving sinners. That when the younger brother comes home, we're going to see it in, in, in two weeks, that the father does what? He runs to him. He throws his arms around him and embraces him. He welcomes him to his home. He slaughters the fattened calf. And he calls everybody around to come and to celebrate because this son of his that was once lost has now been found. He welcomes him. And then the other way that it's going to show us is the Pharisee's way of receiving sinners. And we see that picture in the picture of the older brother that as the sinner comes home, he just stands outside. And what does he do? He grumbles. And he complains about how dare they let that brother come back. See, understand here, church, God wants celebrators. He wants a church that is excited and ecstatic when lost people come to know Jesus. And who are willing to go wherever it takes and do whatever it takes to seek and save that one which was lost. 
And he summarizes it here in verse 7 by saying, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner. And there's that, there's that major emphasis again. One sinner. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. I think there's a great picture there in the power and the love that God has for that one. There's a verse in Luke 12, verse 6, that talks about the price of sparrows. In Luke 12, verse 6, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And then in Matthew 10, 29, it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Somebody who has some, some business sense, let's try to kind of hash this out for a second. It says that there's two sparrows that are sold for one penny, and five sparrows are sold for two. All right? Now, you would naturally think that it would be what? If two are for one, then what would it would be what? Four for two. But it's not. It's five for two. Now, you guys who have any sense of kind of business, you guys know what that is, right? It's a freebie, right? It's where they throw in one extra one because that one extra one is inconsequential in light of the worth of trying to make the bigger sale. In other words, what they're saying is we're going to throw in this extra one because you know what? It doesn't really matter. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Or sorry, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. And then in Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Luke 12, verse 7, kind of pulls this all in together by saying that why? Even... The hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. Fear not. For you are of more value than many sparrows. An idea that if God knows even the sparrow, if he cares for and is concerned with and sees even the needs of the sparrow, how greater is his love for you? He says he would leave the 99. He would abandon all in order to go after just that one. Do we get the depth of the love of the Savior that is being portrayed here? That even if it was only for me, even if I or you were the only one that Jesus was going to die for, that, that would be saved, Jesus would have still gone to the cross for that one. Because that's how much you mean to him. What an incredible picture of a loving Savior. What an incredibly powerful picture of a God that loves the lost, that doesn't turn his back on the hurting and the afflicted, but instead welcomes all who humbly come to him and seek his face. I don't care. Listen to me, church. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what struggles you've had. I don't care how you failed in the past. The Bible tells us that if you will come to him, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's a God of grace that goes after the one, that searches diligently until he finds it. And then once he finds it, he secures it and places it on its shoulders so that we can't get lost again. You see, you can't lose what's been given to you by God. And then he does what with it? He brings it all the way home. What an incredible picture of Jesus. Yo, I'm excited. You think it's good now. Oh, it just builds. It just builds. Next week we're going to see this woman with a lost coin. And then in a couple of weeks we're going to get to see the, the younger brother and the older brother. But man, who I love talking about. It really gets me going. It's the Father. Man, there's some good stuff. Let's pray. And then we're going to have our time to respond.